Welcome to the East End Education Forum. During these shows, we'll discuss the challenges facing our schools and local innovating innovations designed to meet those challenges. This series is sponsored by the East Hampton Education Foundation. They have provided programming, grants, and scholarships for East Hampton Town Schools since 2005. For today's panel, we have three outstanding professionals who have, devote, who have the daunting job of supporting the social and emotional well-being of our students so they can focus on learning. To my right, Christine Cleary, principal of the Spring School. To my immediate left, Brianna Miller, psychologist from the Bridgehampton School. And Aubrey Peterson, a social worker from East Hampton High School. Today's topic, which is continuing the silver lining lessons learned theme, is focused on social and emotional learning, or what educators, uh, the acronym would be SEL. Social and emotional learning have been a topic of research and discussion within the education profession for decades. In recent years, there has been a push to incorporate what we know about social and emotional well-being and student success in high school and in life and trying to get what we know incorporated into the cultural fabric of our schools. Childhood mental health concerns were already steadily rising over the past decade. We have experienced increases in substance abuse and suicide among adolescents nationwide. And the pandemic has compounded these existing problems, adding isolation, fear of sickness, food insecurity, and financial insecurity to the mix. In a recent article, Jackie Mader wrote, we think of trauma as stemming from a defined event, an act of violence, losing a loved one, divorce, etc. But the decades of research on child development have also made clear that trauma is not caused by isolated events alone. Significant levels of ongoing stress, what they call toxic stress, as it is, uh, can dramatically affect young people's brains. The pandemic has caused an environment where ongoing toxic stress can thrive. And these professionals have been dealing with that for um, moving on to it beyond two years now. The first thing I, I think we should do for our audience is define SEL, social emotional learning, because I, I kind of, I've always had trouble with that name because when we say social emotional learning, we think of it as, okay, there's a program we can put in for this. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start with what, what are we talking about when we talk about social emotional well-being of students? I would, I would uh, say that I, I believe it has to do with students learning to become self-aware and, and to um, learn how to be socially aware and how, and how they interact with others and um, also with that social awareness to, uh, or rather self-awareness to learn to look beyond where they are in that moment and, and try to develop a plan for themselves and, and goals and values and things like that, that that help to formulate them as a, a healthy person. Yeah, I think um, for us, social emotional learning sort of lays the groundwork for success, both academically, mm -hmm. behaviorally, mm -hmm. because without having these coping mechanisms, you know, and emotional regulation in a very stressful world, the kids really aren't able to achieve academic success. Um, as the world gets more stressful uh, and the kids are more exposed to aggressive media and, and other, other stressors, I think that these things are being taught less and less in the home and now they're, it's sort of trickled into the schools in order to keep the kids sort of balanced and able to deal with whatever stressors come their way. Yeah, and when you think about social emotional learning, it's it's kind of the heartbeat of the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you really think about it, it's about you know students learning and applying the knowledge of relationships and decision making and self awareness and self management mm -hmm. um, to create that secure, safe environment in the classroom, so they're able to learn mm -hmm. um, and able to succeed. But the the social emotional learning has to come first. 
we, I think when we see the results or, or, or the problems caused by this, we, we see them in the high school level often, um, probably in the middle school and high school. But where, where does the, the learning start? Where, where do we start building those skills? Um, it, from birth. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. From birth mm -hmm. and home, and that's why early intervention and, and, yeah. and early education is so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, we see a huge difference. We're a pre-K through eight school at Springs, and we see such a difference in kids that attend pre-K mm -hmm. than the kids that do not because of the social mm -hmm. structures and just sort of those regulation, that mm -hmm. emotional regulation. And um, it, so I think it starts right, right from the gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and interesting at, you know, Bridgehampton, we're a, a pre-K to 12th grade school. Yeah. So um, as a school psychologist there, I'm, I'm able to see the social emotional learning evolve from the beginning mm -hmm. to an end almost. And it looks different in elementary school up to up to high school. It does. Yes. But the the philosophy and the root of it is is the same. Agreed. One of the things in the introduction, I, I, I took a quote. And at the end, they talk about how these toxic stress can dramatically affect young people's brains. And they're mm -hmm. talking about um, chemical changes in mm -hmm. the brain. Is, can anybody, I, I hate throwing this out there when not knowing if <laughs> anybody's got an expertise, but can, can anybody talk about that and explain it to our audience? You want to? You go ahead. Um, I'm going to base mine on a book that I actually just finished called Kids These Days. And it's all about um, trauma on mm -hmm. the brain and the amygdala and the flight or fight mm -hmm. response, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when you are always under stress, toxic stress, your body goes into fight or flight mode mm -hmm. and y y you really can't regulate it. And because the kids' brains are always developing and they're, they're too young to be fully formed, it makes it very tricky for them to regulate and to really understand the stimuli that's coming in their way. Um, and I think that it makes it impossible for them to really process things properly as far as mm -hmm. academics and information because they are in survival mode. Mm -hmm. I don't, mm -hmm. th that's, that's what I took away from that book. So I hope that that's accurate, mm -hmm. but I've seen it in action. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have too in your, in mm -hmm. your schools. Brianna, do you want to add something? Yeah, the, the amygdala is, is the key part of, of mm -hmm. the brain. So that's definitely right. And also, you know, something I, I talk about as well as the prefrontal cortex for the students yeah. as well. You know, that, that front portion of the brain that um, is about decision making mm -hmm. and which is really difficult for students, um, especially when they're under stress or um, having trauma. Mm -hmm. I think adding to that, you know, there are uh, obviously with the advent of the iPhone and, and, and the presence of, of screen time and, mm -hmm. and all that, that has become such a huge issue. Mm -hmm. and, and just the isolation that's created through that, where, you know, I think back in the day, kids were wanting to see who was doing what when and, and let's go find that party or whatever it yeah. is. Now, hey, I can stay home and have my headphones on and be on the Xbox with my friends, even though I might be talking to them or n might not be, I'm, I'm sort of existing in isolation and that's having a detrimental effect as well. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and, and un, an understanding of this I think is important for all the adults in the building and for parents. Mm -hmm. that this isn't, often the behaviors we're seeing in students aren't something they're saying, oh, I'm going to be a pain in the neck right. today. Right. No, my, my brain, my, the chemical reactions in my brain are telling me that I'm supposed to be focusing on this problem I have mm -hmm. instead of what these adults are asking me to do. And, and we have to understand it in those contexts, I think, to react properly to it. Yeah, I, you know, we, were, we just had a, um, a board of education meeting last night. We were talking about a new behavioral program that we're trying to start after school, and it's about teaching behaviors. Um, and I just, you know, I read a very good quote that said, you know, when a child can't read, we teach them to read. Mm -hmm. When a child can't multiply, we teach them to multiply. But when a child can't behave or doesn't know how to behave, we punish them. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to move away from that and more, you know, to teach these types of behaviors, um, you know, so that they can function, so that these kids can function in society and in, you know, in, the, in their schools. I, I often talk to elementary school teachers oft about this, that in the early grades, kindergarten, first grade, pre-K, um, we, we were teaching compliance, mm -hmm. okay? We were, we were like, 
here's what it means to be a good student. Mm -hmm. And that was all about making the system function in an orderly way. Mm -hmm. And I think now we're seeing a shift to, we're asking you to do, act like this, uh, follow these rules, you know, show, display these behaviors because it's good for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes an intrinsic, um, I'm doing this for me. Mm -hmm. And that is a healthier way to learn. Yes. Mm -hmm. But also to differentiate between students as well for what is best for them in that moment. Yes. Because mm -hmm. that's, yes. that's key. I mean, I just, you see, as you said, we can't just put every kid into neat little boxes and, and let them mm -hmm. do what is expected of whatever the, you know, teacher expects or what have you. There has to be some understanding that each kid comes with their own skills and, and deficits and they need to, to accommodate for that. Yeah. Prior to the pandemic, which seems like a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, and some of us are, <laughs> you, you've only known pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but prior to the pandemic, we were already focused on social emotional learning mm -hmm. and, and health. Where were we then? What, what were we doing in schools? What was like, if you could think back to that, what was the new initiative then? What were we, how were we trying to shift the system? We, we, were, we were meeting on this, uh, I think that was right prior to the pandemic, right? I think it was, that was, that was some coming into the, the, uh, you know, the way of thinking for the district and how, how, to, how to address those issues. Um, I, I think East Hampton's done an amazing job of addressing social emotional well-being. Um, there are programs that we have in the district, uh, such as Sources of Strength. Yes. Um, there is, uh, I, um, uh, what's the one in the middle school? It's called, uh, d d d d I, I try. No, that's, that's what I was going to say, but uh, no, I'm forgetting the name of it. But anyway, um, there's just a lot of program that, that was in place um, to try to address, you know, decision making and, and, and goal setting and being aware of others around you. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, um, speaking for East Hampton, actually, um, I, I used to work at Springs. <laughs> when, I, when I started at Springs, I was the first social worker to ever work there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to see how far schools out here especially have come in terms of providing, uh, you know, services. I mean, mm -hmm. um, prior to the pandemic, we had uh, I think it was five social workers. I think in the district wide, there's nine uh, school counselors and three psychologists. And since then, they've they've added on another social worker. And and uh, you know, there's a lot a lot in place. Um, and there's a willingness to try to uh, to understand what the needs of the kids are. Um, I, I actually run a club called the Justice League, and one of the projects that we came up with uh, a couple of years back was to create an entire room, a, a meditation space. We call, mm -hmm. call it the uh, time, in, time in space. And, uh, you know, it was an opportunity to go in there. And of course, unfortunately, we've had to close it down yeah. with proximity of kids, with, with social distancing. But that's something that's, you know, was established prior to the pandemic and will certainly look to, to do that again. And again, that speaks to understanding that something like meditation, which I think years ago was quite foreign to so many people is yeah. is a part of the the lexicon of what we're doing now i mean you know you can ask a kid and say, oh yeah i have headspace i have yeah. yeah, mm. insight timer mm -hmm. all these amazing apps that are there with guided meditations and guided uh you know for whatever whatever you're dealing with i need to do a meditation for stress i need to do a meditation for sleep mm -hmm. those are out there and you know a little pitch to the audience insight timer and headspace mm -hmm. uh, both great apps yeah. for mm -hmm. for families and adults too to to access as a way to to address that so i think there's just a lot that's been out there um and been implemented to to try and be aware of kids needs cool. agreed i so prior to the pandemic um it's it always seemed to me being in education now for you know 20 some 20 plus years it started with character education and mm -hmm. sort of morphed into yeah. SEL. Um, and then it was very, uh, very much a program or embedded into the curriculum. So at the elementary level, it was second step we adopted. Mm -hmm. And then at uh, the junior high level, we also have second step, but we also have health, you know, health uh, classes. And mm -hmm. a lot of that revolves around SEL concepts. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've worked with outside organizations as, as well, Megan's Law and Tyler's Project. 
And all of that, and I'm, I'm going to echo what, what Aubrey said, came out of the needs of the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we really followed the needs as our demographics changed, as the needs changed in our district, um, you know, and of course with the state mandates. But we really did try to um, fill some of those gaps for our kids because they were hurting and they were coming from situations that were foreign to some of us. Um, unfortunately, they mm -hmm. were real life for, for some of mm -hmm. our kids. I, I, I remember in, I think it was 2018, 19, right before the pandemic, we had gone from two suicide intakes, K through eight to 14. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, pretty eye opening as far as the stress and the distress that our, that our children were dealing with. Um, so I think also opening it up to or outside organizations mm -hmm. and partnering with them. Um, certainly East Hampton has been a huge guide for us mm -hmm. in all the initiatives mm -hmm. there. And, um, you know, you just really try to listen to what the kids need and, and, and put things in place. But I agree with you, Dr. Tiemann, that it, it, it goes above and beyond an actual program. You mm -hmm. have to live it every day and yeah. you have to stop that child in the hall that mm -hmm. looks disconnected and you have to listen at lunch when they're talking or recess and, and really, really get to know the kids and build those relationships. We, we just finished yesterday a, uh, a training of Sources of Strength, which is a program that comes out of uh, University of Rochester mm -hmm. and um, basically what it tries to do it is actually touted as a suicide awareness and prevention campaign mm -hmm. what's interesting is so basically there's a wheel and there's eight protective factors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it teaches students and people who are trained to be an understanding of those different factors and to and to try to access those when you're under stress or having anxiety or what have you mm -hmm. the interesting thing is it's a program, but it's not a program. It's right. something mm -hmm. that we try to sort of put into all aspects of the high school, and it's it's something that just is. Like a framework. So, you know, there mm -hmm. will be students who say, oh, well, I, I'd like to be part of Sources of Strength. Well, you are part of Sources uh -huh. of Strength. It right. is something mm -hmm. that sort of weaves its way into everything we do, yeah. and it's up to the students who are trained as well as uh, the faculty who have been trained to try to make people understand that it's not just, hey, we're doing this, it's happening on Tuesdays at three o'clock. Right. It's, it's much different than that. And but I think trauma think training is so important for staff for, at every yeah. level, bus drivers, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. teaching assistants, yeah. teachers, mm -hmm. administrators. It's yeah. so uh, incredibly important. Yeah. We're trying to move in that direction. Yeah. I do a, um, I, I, was, I was trained uh, a number of years ago in a, a program um, and then was asked to be a facilitator for a program um, called Safe Talk, which is uh, a, a gatekeeper training. Mm. And again, it's, it's, it's not something where, you know, okay, well, only these folks can be, you know, trained in this. Mm -hmm. It's for everybody. It's That's everybody great. involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm planning one for December 7th. And students, it, the library asked me to do it. I've been doing it with them for years, East Hampton Library. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically gives kids 15 and older the opportunity to, to maybe to, to understand um, more about suicide and to address mm -hmm. someone who looks like they may be in distress and not to sort of shy away from it right. and, and to understand right. that mm -hmm. by your asking a question or giving what's called an invitation, you might wind up being able to help that person and then steer them to the helping professional or, or what have you. Um, and having helping professionals in the school is mm -hmm. so important. Yeah. As Aubrey said, we have bolstered our, our, our clinician staff. So we have two school psychologists full time That's and great. a school mm -hmm. social worker yeah. bilingual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has helped tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's still not enough. You yeah. know, yeah. I mean, it's never enough. But um, mm -hmm. I think that us pooling our resources out here on the East End and not waiting for a tragedy, but really supporting yeah. each other yeah. and being preventative and proactive is is very important. Yeah. yeah and you know, the roles that we have um, as counselors and administrators, um, sometimes it's, it's important not to think that we work solo by ourselves, that it's that mm -hmm. um, collaborative approach. You know, interestingly enough, last year was my first year um, in the field and I kind of hit the ground running during this <laughs> um, pandemic time. And social emotional learning, you know, I would like to think has always been embedded into our, um, our schools mm -hmm. for decades and decades, but now we just have this phrase that was coined and has become more of the forefront um, for our students. And, you know, myself as a school psychologist, I, my goal um, professionally is to be 
around and involved and present because I think when you think about school psychologists, you think like, oh, that's the person who's in their office and yeah. has Absolutely. the clipboard and is <laughs> yeah. sending yeah. the emails. But, you know, I, I want to be the person who um, staff looks at, oh, oh, that's the person who is so connected to the students. And yeah. that's the person that as um, a staff member I can lean on, you know. It's amazing the, the value, I, I, and, and actually it becomes a teaching point. Sometimes I'll go through the cafeteria, I'll just sit down with random mm -hmm. tables, mm -hmm. and I'll explain to them, well, guess what? Learning how to new, meet new people, that anxiety doesn't go away. Right. Mm -hmm. Like sitting down with a bunch of uh, freshmen who are looking at me like I'm crazy when I sit down with them, I'm feeling that anxiety. Mm -hmm. But to do that, as Brianna was saying, I'm exposing myself to as many kids as I can, so that when they're having a tough time or whatever, they can they can right. find their way to mm -hmm. to our offices, and it, it really does make a difference. I, whether it's pushing into classes mm -hmm. or running clubs or coaching mm -hmm. or whatever, all that is part of I think you know the mm -hmm. the the best way to, to be a helper. You yeah. Know? You know, two things that came up. Um, one, you mentioned uh, bilingual, mm -hmm. and I know in my time at East Hampton, um, and I'm sure in, in all the districts, uh, and I'm sure it continues finding bilingual staff mm. um, is important because 50 percent of our students at this point um, are, are you know from mm -hmm. spanish-speaking commu uh, community even and pushing 60 i think 60 mm -hmm. yeah. and and they need to see and hear people like them succeeding learning english succeeding in a, you know yeah. that having that role model yeah. is mm -hmm. is important being able to communicate in the native language with parents is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. a and the other thing that came up, um, the adults in the building, which you all alluded to, need to be modeling mm -hmm. exactly what we're asking the students to do. Mm -hmm. And to be honest about it, for a teacher, for you to sit down at, at a table and say, yeah, this is hard for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. stressful. This, yeah. this causes me anxiety. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I have to do it. That's my job. This mm -hmm. is, uh, to mm -hmm. model that that, do that that doesn't go away, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, and it's it's funny because I I'm actually bilingual. I, I use that loosely. I'm always a little bit uh, resistant to using that term. I do speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the prettiest accent at all mm -hmm. times. <laughs> but having said that, when uh, just the other day when I when I had a, a student that I was I was introducing to our whole school and 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 giving a tour with the help of another student or with a uh, student another student who was helping with the tour. Um, to be able to show, hey, look, I'm willing to, to take a chance here and, and mm -hmm. speak Spanish with you. Mm -hmm. Guess what? When you come on, come in and, and hang out with me, I'd like you to give it a try to, to speak your English. If it, if, if it isn't perfect, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's, that's an important thing to try to, to, to put on to, to other kids, you know, to mm -hmm. kids. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and showing them and, and telling them that being bilingual is such a strength. Yeah. It, it, it's yes. a, it's oh, such yeah. a gift. It's such a strength. Mm. And, and letting them know it's almost like a superpower you know, that mm. not yeah. all of us yeah. have, mm. you yeah. know. Right. And it really, it makes them, you know, it, it really, they teach, they teach me and they laugh at my accent yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think being being willing to be vulnerable in front of the kids, yeah. whether you're an administrator, yes. whether yes. you're a mm -hmm. social worker, whether you're a psychologist, whether you're mm -hmm. the superintendent, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I think they really, really respond to that because we're all human beings at the end of the day. And that really is, that's where they're going to really make that connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I found um, with working with Jimmy Stewart on sources yeah. of strength as the assistant superintendent, participating in that and having students see someone yeah. from central office mm -hmm. being vulnerable you yeah. you you sit there and yeah. you you talk about how you're feeling inside and things that happen to you and, and doing it honestly yes mm -hmm is something students should see. Mm -hmm. And in that particular workshop, I mean, the first hour we spend time playing games and, and what we call icebreakers. Mm -hmm. And so when we're, you know, we as adults are running around being goofy or, or what have you, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, it means a lot, I think. It, it, and the kids love to see that. And the hierarchy goes away mm -hmm. and you all become people struggling to be their best selves. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... In a crazy world. Yeah, in a <laughs> crazy very, world. And acknowledging that it's a crazy world. Right. Mm -hmm. um, not sugarcoating and pretending that everything's okay because I don't think, 
you know, they, they know, they feel it. They, they okay. know that things are not, that things are off and they know that things have gotten mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, wonky. So I, I think having those honest conversations, even when they're little, they get it, yeah. they know, oh, yes. mm -hmm. you know? I think the, the younger they are, the more, the more they <laughs> the see more through honest, everything yeah. else and they, they <laughs> get right to it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking about, you know, how wonky it's gotten, yeah. um, can you share some of the experiences you've had with student trauma now during the COVID crisis and steps taken um, to address those problems? Because our, our audience is parents mm -hmm. and, and we want them to know honestly yeah. what's going on in our schools and mm -hmm. how we're working to make sure that their children are safe and doing their best. Who wants to start? Yeah, there's so sure. much. This yeah. is really yeah, going to open a can of worms. Yeah. That's, that's what we hit. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, when, and by the way, it came to me, it's, it's Why Try. I Try is the, yes. is the other yes. program, okay, but good. Why Try is the one in the middle school, which is wonderful as well. Um, but I think that uh, when we started this year, I, I believe it was our superintendent said that we were, were I'm fine, we're saying that this is, about a retor return to normalcy. Mm -hmm. So to allow for the idea that, okay, this isn't gonna be sort of a in regular year, it's not gonna be perfect, we're going to have mm -hmm. bumps along the way and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. I think to, to have the understanding, it allows teachers, it allows paraprofessionals, it allows anyone working in the building to be able to say, okay, well, um, you're having a rough day, Mm. Again, as going mm -hmm. back to what I said before, do I need to, as a teacher, do I need to differentiate instruction? Flexibility. Do I, yeah, yeah. Do I need to make a referral to a psychologist or social worker? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I need to, um, you know, have a few minutes with this student after class and give him or her that late pass because this is important. This mm -hmm. is, so I think that's a, a huge part of what's happened mm -hmm. um, beyond just sort of brick and mortar programming type thing, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, uh, you see it. I mean, I, my my phone is ringing off the hook. My door is opening and closing constantly. Um, you know, a lot of that is self-referral, a lot of that is parent referral, but a lot of it is also teachers saying, hey, can you just check in with this kid for mm -hmm. five minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think there's an understanding that we've come through over the years, certainly with, with regards to uh, suicide awareness, it is understood by, by faculty and staff that if a student um, is expressing something along those lines, that they are not the ones to take, take control of that, that they need to not wait till tomorrow, not right. wait till the end of the day, at that right. moment, pick up the phone, call mm -hmm. one of the support staff people and make sure they're seen right mm -hmm. away. Right. And I think that just, you know, it's, it's really now part of um, the normalcy of mm -hmm. the building and that in that everybody knows to do that i think you, you don't you don't really see you know oh by the way this kid was was having thoughts of suicide two days ago no. it's, it's understood mm -hmm. you know yeah. and, and i think we've come a long way in, in terms of that understanding That's yeah funny. and you know the pandemic has um interestingly when we think of trauma um we think of students who are going through trauma it's one um, situation that they're dealing with alone, but mm -hmm. the pandemic has, you know, unfortunately caused everyone to be experiencing the same trauma across the board, no mm -hmm. matter what your role is in the school, no matter how old you are. Um, and with that being said, um, students have lost family members. Mm -hmm. um, parents have lost their jobs. There's food insecurity. Everything, you know, that you mentioned in the beginning introduction, um, has been really tough on um, staff members, students. Um, school is everything to kids. I, mm -hmm. I think we don't we don't really realize that, but I think we noticed that when we were two weeks into the pandemic, and mm -hmm. everyone was asking when you know we're yeah. going back, yeah. which was surprising. Um, but something that we implemented in, in our school this year, um, it derived from our our wellness committee is every week we send out a survey that um, is a check-in mm -hmm. that uh, it's different questions based on uh, the students grades but it's questions like how are you feeling um, do you need to speak to your go-to person um, if so who would that be and it just allows us to assess students who would be under the radar you know yeah. who aren't um, students who receive mandated counseling or students who we have on our radar who are at risk it it allows us to assess all students and gives them a platform where they don't have to say, you know, 
hey, Miss Smith, I'm feeling upset today. I want to speak to my counselor. Um, they could do it on the computer. It's more private. Um, and they have the opportunity to do it weekly. Um, so that's been right. an important um, piece and ha of And having that, the, excuse me, having mm -hmm. that go-to person is so important. It's yeah. one of the things in Source of Strength we speak about is making sure every child has a person, an adult that they are connected yeah. to in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, it is, otherwise they, as you said, they fall through the, through the cracks. Yeah. And, yeah, what, one of the biggest issues we, we dealt with at our, in our school district was latchkey kids mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic, um, whether or not family had to go and take care of other family members yeah. in a different geographic location, or they had to work to put food on the table yeah. um, if they hadn't lost their jobs. And with that came a lot of lack of supervision, adult supervision and mm -hmm. abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, we saw a very big uptick in in, in child abuse yeah. and sexual abuse. Um, one of the things our district was able to do was get this over the summer was was get about 50, 50 kids into a Project Most summer program so that they were not home alone during the day. Some mm -hmm. of the living situations, you know, there's multiple families living in a house or there's, mm -hmm. you know, people renting out rooms. So you're not, the kids aren't always with somebody that's trusted that they know. Right. So that was, that was a terrible uh, consequence, I think, that came out of the mm -hmm. pandemic. And it's something that, again, our support, our, our school social worker and our school psychologist and our superintendent and everybody was on board to help these kids mm -hmm. and really, really pay attention. And mm -hmm. then also afford, uh, give them, teach them the, cope, the skills, the communication skills to tell somebody, a trusted adult. Yeah. adult. And it was yeah. very interesting because once one child sort of opened that up and told, you saw them confiding in each other, confiding mm -hmm. in somebody yeah. at, at, at one of the programs, and it really helped us to troubleshoot each individual yeah. case once we knew about it. It's funny, there's another sort of change in, in how, how society has changed is, I think for the most part, this idea of the tattletale has yeah. has mm. diminished. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, some I, I have kids come into my office sometimes and say, "Hey, listen, I have a friend who's ha who's thinking, you know, having thoughts of suicide, mm -hmm. or I have a friend who yeah. has something going on, or whatever it is." And that idea that oh, am I am I being a narc? Am I am right. I tattletaling? That seems to be. I think sort of post Columbine and post 9-11 yeah. in you terms like airports and all you, exactly right. and that's all part of how, how we think now yeah. and I think that that's yeah. an incredible development that we can have uh, you know students being able to come forward and say you know even hey um, I heard somebody yes. said said this or you know this is going on in the bathroom or whatever it yeah. is there's concern there and there's an understanding that I can help somebody else mm. simply by going and speaking to a, a, a trusted yep, adult yep, mm -hmm. basically you know and, and it's it's wonderful you know yeah because if you don't know you can't help and, right. and yeah. yeah I had a situation where um, a student came to me and it was about a friend he had met online and this friend was in another country yeah oh and yeah. believe it or not oh, yeah. we actually were able to he had remembered something about where they were mm. and 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 we were able to make contact with with the authorities in that mm. country and it went wow. and this oh, kid was amazing. unfortunately this young man that his friend um was actually walking to to complete suicide mm. and and when he was when he was put into his police car he um he, <laughs> unfortunately he winds up seeing on the display of the police uh, panel or what have you, where the call was coming from or whatever, and knew that it was my student. Mm. So he was very angry at my student. But an hour later, he called back and said, hey, you know what? You saved my life. Mm -hmm. wow. I was literally going to complete wow. suicide, and you saved my life, and thank you. Mm -hmm. And so that my student was able to understand in that moment in a, in a very personal way how important it is to come forward even if it's so far removed mm -hmm. you know and, and I think in this day and age going back to the to the bit about screens and 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 being by yourselves the way students socialize now is so different so that that this student had a a friend who he really truly considered a a friend or a good friend in another country who he had never met right. face to face right. that's something we have to understand mm -hmm. you know it's it's a lot different than than when you know 
I think most of us were growing up, and, and it's, it's a totally different it ballgame now. Mm -hmm. So um, that has to be understood, too, that the reality of, of how they function, we have to adapt to them and not just be mm -hmm. stuck in our way and how this, this should happen. Yep. Right. Uh, and also, too, I think just, just understanding, being aware, and, and this is really more for parents, because I think all of us in education were exposed to this. We know just really the, the, the level of indecent material that kids are exposed to on their phones, on mm -hmm. social media, on yeah. their video games. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, there's never been more access to yeah. kids and kids have never had more access to the outside world, yeah. good, bad, and ugly. We see that over and over again. And, and that also goes back to supervision. You know, there's a generation gap yeah. with technology yeah. and, mm -hmm. and being digital natives or not. And we see older siblings watching younger siblings. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the six-year-old is seeing something that might be appropriate on TikTok for a teenager, but not for a six-year-old. Yeah. And, and, and there's all of that has, has, has an effect, you yeah. know, on their behavior and on their brain and, development. And almost as a, a little plug here, there are, there are so many amazing um, apps and that kind of thing now where you can have you know, an Control. understanding of exactly what your what your yeah. child is doing. I, we have yep. Verizon in yep. my home, and we're able Family. to to see what's being used, how much screen time yeah. there is. There's mm -hmm. reports that come out. So if the folks out there in TV land don't know it, there are actually mm -hmm. wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things to do, and 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 to where you can actually regain control, where you can press mm -hmm. a button, and all of a sudden it cuts off the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. um, or the cell service. Of, of your child yeah. if they're up at yeah. you know 11:30 at yeah. night where it takes a little of that mm -hmm. pressure of not having to maybe you know fight it out or what have you where you can just say this is the way it is mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know about your districts but you must probably have some sort of a search um, yes yeah securely yes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we have uh, you know light speed and what it does mm -hmm. is you know it, if a student searches something that's yeah. questionable mm -hmm. and not necessarily even indecent but something that might yeah. be how to yeah. how to commit suicide how yeah. we've actually intervened in quite a few yeah. quite a yeah. few suicide yeah, tests because constant, of those searches yeah. constant effort at, at, yeah. at the school for yeah. sure it comes in a lot and um, yeah. there's a lot of eyes on it and we sort of make sure yeah. mm -hmm. okay so let's follow through and sometimes it's hey this this right. student is in health class yes and they're learning about right. whatever they're it is a and, and so, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but so but said, as, as one teacher said the other day, better safe than sorry. Exactly. They were okay with being bugged 20 times a day as a health teacher because, yep. mm -hmm. you know, it's for the well-being of the That's child. That's right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so one of the things, I'm listening to the conversation, um, the students going to those latchkey problems and things, we've got to also take into consideration that the adults were going through the same isolation, fear of sickness, mm -hmm. food insecurity, financial instability. Mm -hmm. Th those same trauma mm -hmm. pieces w were part of the and are still part of the adult community also mm -hmm. um, and we, we can't fix that that's not within our, our realm of influence right. but we have to help kids deal with that um, and the other thing when you were talking about having every student connected to an adult and I, when you said that I was thinking back to when I was middle school principal I'm going back probably 20 years at this point and the advisory programs that were supposed to be part of every middle school when we switched from yep. junior high to middle school. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. supposed to be one of the reasons, yeah. advisory programs, because even then we knew how much better every student would do if they felt a personal connection to mm -hmm. one adult in the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, throughout my career, it was impossible to get started. Mm. Yeah. Okay? One of the most frustrating parts for 30 plus years mm. um, because it means rethinking other foundational parts right. of school right. which we're not willing to rethink, um, which is, and we probably should do a whole show on this, the schedule. Mm -hmm. which and, is state a, yes. <laughs> and state mandates. Yes. yes, and state mandates. Yeah. Um, but such an important part that we've known about for such a long time yeah. that we haven't been able to implement properly which should be yeah. in every school. It's not just yeah. a middle school idea. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. sh and it's just how human beings function better. Yeah, right, know. yeah. Uh, and then the other thing was, when we started this with a discussion of return to normalcy. That was one of the first things you said. <laughs> yeah. Yet, this discussion was all about things that hopefully will not go away. 
you know, the, the, this, this supports, all, yeah. all these supports, mm -hmm. all the, the, the idea that teachers are comfortable with taking these mental health concerns mm -hmm. into consideration uh, instead of punishing, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. but actually supporting, that's a huge shift. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk a little bit about trying to maintain yeah. that. Yeah. You know, do you, mm -hmm. what are the pieces that we've been forced to do because of COVID that you as the mental health professionals uh, mm -hmm. you know, would like to hang on to because it's good for kids and good for mm -hmm. their learning? It seems to be um, almost a cultural change um, among the school um, that has happened um, throughout this pandemic. And um, teachers became not only teachers, but counselors, disciplinarians, friends, mm -hmm. almost parent-like um, to a lot of our students. Um, so I think something that, that whole relationship is something that hopefully will continue to um, foster that you're not stuck in your role as an educator um, we can all wear different hats at different times, depending on what that looks like for each student. Um, and again, just back to just that cultural shift, you know, it used to be, if you can hear me, clap your hands mm. three times. And now, um, you know, I heard, if you can hear me, take a deep breath, mm. you know? <laughs> so things like that, that when we have um, new staff coming in and, and new mental health professionals and new administrators to all just continue to collaborate and be on the same page and know that you're not stuck in your role and you're not alone in it and continue that that teamwork um, to help this move forward is is ideal and hopefully we continue to do that. I think a lot of that can come through just familiarity with each other. I, yeah. I, unfortunately, I was sort of struck by the idea when, when uh, the district completed their $80 million renovation, you know, 12, 15 years ago, whatever it was, we, we moved from being sort of, everyone sort of accessing the faculty room to, well, everyone now has their own space. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can, I can have my lunch in here or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a little bit more effort now to, to know each other and to, mm -hmm. and to make sure, mm -hmm. because when, when I know an English teacher well, they are gonna feel more comfortable stopping yeah. by my office and saying, hey, I'm worried about so-and-so. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's really huge. And I, I think on, on some level, having more opportunities for teachers to interact in, a, um, in an environment that is, is uh, you know, team building is wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really important. And um, having a, a background in, in project adventure facilitation and what we had back years ago with Boys Harbor. Um, sometimes there's, there's some thoughts of, of maybe, maybe making that happen again, which is amazing. We have Camp Quinnipet, but mm -hmm. you know, beyond the value that I've seen so strongly for individuals and small groups of students, there's a value in that for, for teachers with teachers too. Yeah. And, and knowing each other and being able to say, Okay, I, I know you. I'm, I have comfort, I, I'm comf comfortable to have a discussion with you about this student or, or um, what have you. I think that's really, really important. And, and for us not to be those islands and, and reflective mm -hmm. of maybe what our, our, some of our students are doing at home. And just, uh, tr you know, trusting each other as well. When we're in, you know, the pandemic is essentially in a state of crisis. So sometimes there wasn't time to sit and dwell on certain topics, you know administrators had to trust us as the mental health mm -hmm. um, experts in, yeah. in the in the building and we had to trust our administrators and administrators had to trust their teachers and it just built those relationships that hopefully continues where we can all lean on each other um, yeah I think for there was a huge paradigm shift in what are we allowed to do during the school day because mm -hmm. we are so used to having so many mandates and yeah cover the curriculum and, and everything mm -hmm. was on such a um a fast forward reel and i the pandemic allowed us to slow things down mm -hmm. and really sort of take stock and go all right it's okay to stop your lesson and check in with those kids right. it's okay to 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 build those relationships with your colleagues it's okay to spend a superintendent's conference day doing icebreakers, playing, mm -hmm. yeah. playing two, two truths and a lie yeah. Mm -hmm. with people you've been exactly. working with for 20 years, yeah. but didn't yeah. know they were afraid of heights, yeah. you know, right. things mm -hmm. like that. And I think 
giving that permission to the adults in the building, whether they be teachers or, or whoever, I think that has been a huge shift for us. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that continue because I think things were so regimented yeah. for so long. Yeah. And I think that fear came kind of trickled down from state ed mm -hmm. and, you know, that way. And of course, there's always going to be mandates. And, you know, our job is to move that needle, you know, on achievement. But I think at the end of the day, we, we really remember that we're all human beings and, and we were sort of in this together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I appreciated that. I appreciated mm -hmm. slowing things down a little bit. And I think a lot of, a lot of us did. It's funny because you talk about, um, these, these shifts mm -hmm. and worrying about moving the needle on state assessments. Mm -hmm. But when we look at this and understand it deeply, if we want students to learn, this is necessary. Agreed. Yeah. And if Agreed. we want staff mm -hmm. to do their best work, mm -hmm. this is necessary. Agreed. So these, these shifts that start to support social emotional health mm -hmm. as a foundation to mm -hmm. learning if they become how we continue to do business, I think they will move the needle. Mm -hmm. I think w one of the problems we've had throughout my career as educators is worrying about the test and the piece of information that might be on the test mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the standards <laughs> and the learning that's required to master that, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. different from filling in that blank, yeah. choosing the right multiple choice teaching students to be problem solvers so that they can look at a multiple choice mm -hmm. question and solve that problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the knowledge they have. We can teach that way and it's much more supportive of students' intrinsic motivation. There are shifts that can mm -hmm. be made that I think will help us emotionally, socially, and academically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to get people to buy into that because it seems too big. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think one of the, 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 the silver linings that has come out of, out of the pandemic is, you know, when, back when we were all um, doing everything virtually, you know, there was a window into, quite literally, yeah. <laughs> into the, li the private lives of our students. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. you know, I, I found that sometimes just ta having a conversation with a kid and seeing that poster on their wall or whatever yeah. it is, you know, elicited conversation. And I think that for teachers, for a lot of them who might not have otherwise had the luxury or the time or whatever it was to get to know those kids on that level, mm -hmm. I think that has, has shifted and that's, mm -hmm. that's allowed for, um, you know, a, a greater understanding of the needs. And, and, you know, for those of us in the helping profession, you know, we, we maintain so many sort of secrets about what kids go through and we have you know because of confidentiality rules we have you know limited ability to explain what's going on other than hey you know what this kid's going through a lot um and now when kid when teachers and and other folks start to understand that holy cow what they are going through the fact that they even get themselves into the building yeah. every day yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a miracle yeah. that mm -hmm. that you know they're having breakfast not because they want the free muffin they're having breakfast because they didn't they don't get breakfast at home and they don't, you know, that lunch might be the last meal of their day and all, all those kind of things. Yeah. It makes a huge difference for, um, for everybody to understand that. And, and they're, they're seeing it now on a, a more firsthand basis. I think kids are getting better at, um, you know, explaining what's going on and, yeah. and sharing a little bit. And, and, and um, unfortunately that's, you know, happening through their their anxiety and stress but mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. you know it is allowing for an under a deeper understanding of what kids are going through and yeah. it just goes back to you know if a student's mental health is unstable they're not going to learn mm -hmm. and it's very it's pretty simple um in that way and you know when you compare physical health to mental health um a student isn't going to perform to their best ability in gym if they have asthma and they don't have their inhaler, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if we compare that to mental health, a student with anxiety who's having a tough day is not going to learn the algebra lesson like they should have. So really taking that in, that whole philosophy into consideration is kind of the premise of, of social emotional learning and where we are at educators at yeah, this point. Being self-aware, I mean, you know, it's one of the wonderful things about the new the new building at the high school is that the nurse's office, there's three or four beds. 
and and you know kids will just go there and they'll just go and chill mm -hmm. you know and that's so that's such a, a, a wonderful thing a that they can recognize in themselves they need that but there's a place they can go now too mm -hmm. you know I mean I, I always whenever I'm speaking towards this I always think of you know the culture in Japan where people understand a nap is a good thing mm -hmm. and, and we live in a culture that doesn't in any way tolerate that and mm -hmm. maybe we're moving to an understanding that taking a rest you know meditating having a, a quiet space to be for a little while can re you know rejuvenate you for the, the rest of the day or what have you and just to go back to aubrey's point about a window into the world of our kids some of our kids school is their safe place mm -hmm. yeah. um, some of yes. our kids don't have a place like that to go in their own homes yeah. um you know and i think creating a safe and nurturing place for everybody kids of all ages sometimes we think kids age out of needing that nurturing and that mm -hmm. but they don't you know we know adults need it too and 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 knowing that that school might only be the only safe safe place in that that decompression mm -hmm. zone that they have in their lives yeah and taking that very seriously yeah i mean with with the housing crunch and everything yeah. that's happening here can't tell you how many homes I've been in where a child has no privacy. Absolutely. They have no place to just None. chill. So when they're hanging around in town mm -hmm. and, and there's a, well, why is that young man hanging out in town? Right. Well, the reason why is because at least he feels that he's got a place to Absolutely. be where he just can be on his own or mm -hmm. whatever. And it's, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole nother yeah. episode. <laughs> but, yeah, right. right. Well, you know, the feeling like, you have yeah. some control over your life is, yeah. is hard yeah. for some yeah. kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I think about... Um, the beginnings of the COVID crisis when I was still working at East Hampton and we wound up delivering lunches. I think that shocked people yeah. how many lunches yeah. we were delivering and we were working with Springs also yes, on that. Yes, you were. Thank and, you for uh, that. Yep. that. That was amazing. It was. Mm -hmm. um, the, the amount of uh, need mm -hmm. yeah. there was in such an incredibly wealthy community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, when you talk to people who are visiting from the city or what have you, and you tell them that they, you know, that we have, you know, our, our, the recipients of our free and reduced lunch programs are, you know, in the in the realm of 50 to 60 yep. percent. What? Exactly. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And and sort of the whole understanding that there is a another side to our community is mm -hmm. is enormous. We we have, mm -hmm. I actually I, um, we just started a. Uh, a couple of years ago, we have a food pantry in the high school. Okay. Um, there's one in John Marshall, which is accessed every single day. Um, mm -hmm. Middle school's in the works. And I know it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's springs and even popping up around the community yeah. are these little mini, you know, food pantries elevated. Little, little free food pantries. Free, exactly, and, yes. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, and those are being accessed. They are being accessed. You know, mm -hmm. just, a, you know, a jar of peanut butter, yeah. or a, a package yeah. of pasta can make the difference for somebody. It, it does. So. We, we, we've, we got involved with Blessings in a Backpack um, mm -hmm. several years ago, and that's, you know, so every student who needs it goes home with a backpack filled with food. Yeah. Um, and it's been again eye-opening because you know that food never comes back but they're, they're, they're using that yep. and, and, yeah. and that is something that's again feeding our kids so yeah, yeah. And, and like you said these are deep socioeconomic issues yeah. housing crisis you know jobs uh, you know food mm -hmm. insecurity um, but they all affect schools you know yeah. they all affect our kids yeah. mm -hmm. when I, I think about the shifts okay mm -hmm. The idea of, of teaching uh, as going into your classroom and closing the door <laughs> and it's your world in there, right. mm. hopefully that's gone. Yeah. Oh, both for the benefit of the students who need teachers who plan together mm -hmm. and for the benefit of the teachers who need to not feel like they're by themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other thing is, I was thinking about when you, you were talking about that um, shift where students feel comfortable going and saying, I, I need to be by myself and rest for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I think about my years, again, going back even more than 20, as a high school assistant principal where students who made that claim right away were, were labeled as gaming the system, mm. trying to get away with something. Or they're high. Or they're high. Mm -hmm. yeah, all these reasons not to accommodate that behavior. Yeah. This is an important change, mm -hmm. that, that that's no longer how schools will be dealing with that. But we need to actually look at students as the people they are and the complexity of their lives comes into our school every day, which mm -hmm. goes to what you were saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. um, have you seen changes in instruction 
And I know some of you are in the classrooms and, and some not as often, mm -hmm. but the way teachers <coughs> are presenting new learning to students, is that shifting? Is that changing? Because I think that's part of what needs to shift. Well, I've seen a lot more collaboration since, mm -hmm. since the pandemic. I think people couldn't help but <clears throat> lean on one another, whether it was help me with this new technology or it was, oh my gosh, you know, how are we gonna make this work with these weird schedules and hybrid and all that. Um, so collaboration, I think, has, has definitely increased, which I, I'm a huge proponent of. And um, again, I think, going back to Brittany's point, having that, those mindful moments, mm -hmm. using maybe sound chimes mm -hmm. or sound bowls or mm -hmm. incorporating that mindfulness, that Eastern philosophy sort of in, in throughout mm -hmm. the day for mm -hmm. transitions or, you know, and just again, slowing things down a little bit and not always being on that hamster wheel of, of you know, mm -hmm. of, it, of covering the curriculum, yeah, if that, you will. <laughs> that, that, that phrase of covering the curriculum yeah. has always driven me insane. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even remember which speaker <clears throat> early in my career said, why would we want to cover up the curriculum? <laughs> Which is what you do by going yeah. to mm -hmm. the, try to cover so many ridiculous yeah. broad mm -hmm. spectrum of, of yeah. learning and going so quickly that mm -hmm. nobody can really dig into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that's a state problem that mm -hmm. we, we all should be pushing back against. Correct. Um, any other classroom changes? Any other shifts? I, like I do know even before I left that idea of a little take a time out during class was mm -hmm. becoming the norm. Yeah. Um, allowing students to take that deep breath, mm -hmm. close your eyes, we're gonna mm -hmm. meditate for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a minute, two mm -hmm. minutes, yeah. Yeah. very yeah. short little snippets. I saw it throughout the elementary school, it was making mm -hmm. its way up to the higher grades. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you see that expanding? Do you see that becoming norm? Yeah, I've seen um, in a lot of our classrooms, teachers creating um, a specific space for students in the classroom. Um, a lot of teachers refer to it as a calming corner mm. um, or something along those lines that yep. if a student needs that moment, they have a space in the classroom that they can go to that has breathing tools, um, fidget toys, mm. um, things along those lines. So they don't always have to leave the classroom right. in that right. moment. Right. They have a space that's mm. available to them. And something that um, we have been doing during the pandemic and continue to do now that all of our students are back is our um, morning announcements that um, were virtual when everyone was at home done by uh, one of our school counselors. And we continue to do it where students send in clips of what they're doing at home, whether it's cooking or something along those lines, um, videos of them participating in sports. Um, and every Wednesday we do a wellness Wednesday, whether it's, uh, you know, myself, um, having a, a little segment on mindfulness and what that mm -hmm. looks like, or um, some of our teachers jumping in um, about yoga or meditation mm -hmm. or, or affirmations. E even even something as simple as lighting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm finding more and more people are turning off the lights, okay. turning off you know, the harsh fluorescence and yeah. saying, hey, you know what, we can, we can create a space where, yeah. where you know, natural light is better or, or, or you know, it just is not so, right. Um, I, I we're out of time. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to thank <laughs> you for mm -hmm. coming. This has been a great conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I hope the audience appreciates um, all your work and, and the insights you've given them into uh, the struggles in school, the daily struggles to help our students. Um, and that, that concludes this, this session. Thank you. Thank you.